Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Robust federalism is not just a requisite for effective governance, but it also serves as the basis for social, cultural and most importantly economic growth of a country. In these times, with the world a global village, it becomes imperative for the two Indian pillars, the union government and the state governments, to synergize their economic endeavours to achieve optimal results. Let's see how the collaborations have fared thus far and what we can expect in future. Uttar Pradesh recently sent several delegations around the world to business conferences and bilateral meetings with their counterparts to promote the state, which is fast emerging as an economic powerhouse within the country. Uttar Pradesh, India's most populous state, has set a target of becoming a $1 trillion economy by 2027 and is working overtime to secure foreign direct investment worth $1 trillion USD during the Global Investors Summit, which it is set to host in January of next year. Once among the least developed states in the country, the state has made significant progress and aspires to be at the top of the state GDP charts in years to come. Uttar Pradesh is currently the third biggest state economy in India. However, the state's corresponding per capita GDP figures do not enjoy the same reputation. The government, however, says that its policies have by and large emulated the central government's framework of providing top-notch infrastructure, addressing procedural delays, and establishing a single window grievance redressal system. Observers have also acknowledged and praised Uttar Pradesh's economic model and have stated that it is a good work in progress. You will see in almost 40 plus government schemes, central government scheme, Uttar Pradesh is number one, be it the distribution of gas, be it, the, uh, be it electricity, be it toilets, be it Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana. In many of, almost 40 of them, Uttar Pradesh is number one because the coupling is very strong. Uttar Pradesh is not the only state that is headed for a bright future. From Gujarat and Maharashtra in the west, to Tamil Nadu in the south, to Odisha and Assam in eastern and northeastern India, states across the country, irrespective of their government's political hue, are showing positive economic trends. States across India have set their eyes on becoming trillion dollar economies. Observers say interstate economic competition will only benefit India on the whole. Someone like BJD, which is also which also fights fiercely against BJP in their state, whenever they, they want investment for their state, whenever there is any problem in the state, they work very closely with central government, even though they are from a different party. So there are various examples, but by and large, federal structure of India is working beautifully well. It would not be incorrect to credit the federal foundation of the Indian state for promising growth across the board. Interestingly, this economic growth also comes at a time when it appears that many political parties' focus remains on mudslinging their opponents. However, the Indian system is inherently structured so that state and central governments can work together to achieve the most for Indian citizens. There have been problems, tensions between centre and states. But even then, despite tensions and challenges, the federal system has served the interest of India. Udaipur, under Congress rule, being the host of the very first event under India's G20 presidency, is clear evidence that political biases or leanings do not hamper the country's collective approach of prioritising people over politics. In India, the federal system is a symbiotic arrangement. The central government's rule doesn't end with the collection of taxes from the states. It is bound to the states and provides all forms of assistance to the states in times of need. Intergovernmental institutions like the Interstate Council, Niti Ayo, and the GST Council have been successfully resolving the differences and other issues between the governments. Today, India stands on the verge of an economic revolution, 
The world is looking to India, and India is hoping to receive enthusiastic participation from all individual states. For example, Morgan Stanley's report on India's impending economic boom projected India's GDP to rise in manufacturing alone from 15.6% to 21% by 2031. How will this be achieved? Well, only with collaborated state center efforts. The union government's multi-layered efforts, including the production-linked incentive scheme and corporate tax cuts aimed at improving the business environment, have further been strengthened by state swift implementations. All predictions and projections indicate a massive economic boom for India in this decade, and a strong state center partnership can take the already shining brand India to greater heights than previously imagined. Moving on. As Sri Lanka takes baby steps to restore economic strength of the country, there are a number of locals who are still not happy with government initiatives. Government's attempts to cheer its citizens up by organizing a Christmas spectacle outside presidential secretariat met cold responses as many of them said that their fight against the government was not over yet. Have a look at the story. For months now, Sri Lanka is embroiled in a deep economic crisis and Colombo's troubles are not seemingly ending anytime soon. But one place that drew cameras and spectators towards it this week and will remain same for at least some days is Gaul Face Green Park. This used to be the prime site for protesters when demonstrations swept through the island nation in wake of outbreak of the forex crisis. Months long protests had culminated into Gotabaya Rajapaksa fleeing the country and later resigning. Ranil Vikrame Singhe has been at the presidential chair since then. A massive Christmas tree composed of artificial lights could be seen occupying the space. A few carnival events such as Navy brand performances and an army dog show were also held on the same grounds. People, however, said that their anger was still rife and they were not going to end their movement until they got freedom from Rajapaksas in real sense. People <laughs> Experts say the government, in a bid to cheer up a demotivated society, has been involved in such activities. Some, however, say they were not impressed by the spectacle, maintaining defiance that the fight continues for the people. One such example is Paikyo Sothi Sarvana Muttu, director of Colombo based Center for Policy Alternatives, who believes that the Christmas carnival is a sign that the government is using to demonstrate its control. I think there are a couple of things that the government wants to establish. First and foremost, it wants to establish that it's very much in control and that this was the headquarters of this great Aragalia. They have reclaimed the space. It's a public space, they've reclaimed it, and now it is being used to celebrate Christmas. Secondly, by doing that, they want to sort of say that, look, there is no question of any public disturbance or anything like that. The country is safe for people to come and invest, for tourists to come, all of that kind of thing. Sri Lanka has laid out a plan to emerge out of the crisis and has hiked several taxes to achieve its fiscal targets. Apart from securing an IMF loan, its negotiations to ensure loans from China, Japan and India are also seemingly fructifying. Moving on. India, with over 20 separate official languages and hundreds of unofficial languages, is extremely linguistically diverse. Indians are extremely proud of their mother tongues and their usage has helped in strengthening cultural identities throughout the country. 
though adopting English as a medium of communication has greatly helped India thrive globally, increasing success rates of vernacular medium students in the country have highlighted the importance of acquiring knowledge through mother tongues. Let's see what steps are being taken to promote linguistic diversity of the country and how much has it succeeded. India, with over 20 separate official languages and hundreds of unofficial languages, is extremely linguistically diverse. Indians are extremely proud of their mother tongues and their usage has helped in strengthening cultural identities throughout the country. Though adopting English as a medium of communication has greatly helped India thrive globally, increasing success rates of vernacular medium students in the country have highlighted the importance of acquiring knowledge through mother tongues. Moreover, research has also shown that when concepts are explained using familiar words and phrases, it leads to improved interpretation. Former President of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, has promoted the teaching of science to children in their local languages. Further, the new education policy of India has emphasized education in local languages for primary classes. When people understand more and they learn more in a better way, automatically any student when you speak or learn in the regional languages, their understanding and once they understand more, their minds process thoughts really expands, they tend to be more research oriented, they can be more creative and all this, instead of being little bookish and only to on the examination point of view. As mobile broadband data has now become affordable, more Indians have access to the internet. According to Google's 2020 report on India, about 85% of online video viewers in the country prefer content in Indian languages. Therefore, the demand for content in local languages is increasing day by day. Google also claims that the number of internet users browsing in Indian languages is expected to reach 536 million over the next four years. Clearly aware of the trend, the Indian government and various edtech platforms are planning to use the range of linguistic diversity in the innovation space. Tracking the interests of multilingual viewers, edtech platforms are planning to design their content in multiple languages, such as Hindi, Tamil, and Bengali. As far as higher education and research is concerned, science, technology, and medicine are increasingly being taught in local Indian languages. Recently, a medical curriculum in Hindi was launched in the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh by Union Home Minister Sri Amit Shah. The decision came as a boon for many Hindi speakers who had aspired to enter the medical profession, but who previously felt excluded from doing so. Aaj. मेडिकल की पढ़ाई हिंदी में शुरू हो रही है कुछ समय में इंजीनियरिंग की पढ़ाई भी हिंदी में शुरू होगी और देश भर में आठ भाषाओं में इंजीनियरिंग के अभ्यासक्रम का अनुवाद शुरू हो चुका है The ongoing experiments of adopting tribal language as a medium of instruction in several states in India is also a large step towards eliminating the language block in learning. The New India believes that language should not be a barrier, but instead a facilitator in acquiring knowledge, and the steps being taken to promote regional languages is allowing more of India's citizens to take advantage of the country's competitive education programs. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. China has received the first ever batch of foreign vaccines from Berlin, which will be administered to German expatriates in coming weeks. 
BioNTech COVID-19 vaccines has WHO permit but is yet to receive approval from European drug regulator. China is home to nearly 20,000 Germans. Although Beijing had agreed for German vaccines a few weeks ago when German Chancellor Olaf Scholz had visited China for a bilateral meeting, the shipment comes at a time when fear of another Covid wave has gripped the entire world. Berlin has also urged China to use the vaccines freely. Beijing has thus far insisted on using domestically developed vaccines. It is however significant to note that Chinese vaccines are under radar for many have accused that they have not been as effective as other vaccines being administered around the world. China has as many as 9 vaccines approved for use but none has matched the efficacy shown by vaccine shots developed by the US, UK or India. As per various viral videos, a massive outbreak of the new COVID-19 variant has rendered a major blow to China's health system. There are reports that medicines are in short supply and hospitals are overwhelmed with infected people in China. Japanese firm NTT Communications is coming up with the latest drone technology under its brand name Docomo Business. NTT Communications is a Japanese telecommunications firm that provides its services to individuals and businesses around the world. With the help and cooperation of its partner companies, drone services are coming into everyday use. こう的にあの普及が進んでいるというのがあの設備あるいはインフラの点検ですね。点検ソリューション。それから農業のソリューション。こういうところでドローンを飛ばして維持を見つけたり、悪いところを見つけてそこにピンポイントで対応する。こうい
作業ができるような世界ができれば、例えばセミナレーター、ご自身の国にいながら、例えば日本であるとか、ほかの海外の国々に対して働きに行くということができる、そういったところの課題にも解決につながるんじゃないかと思っています。Quorum 8, a software developer, has been focusing on the development of VR CG software in recent years, as VR has been effectively used in all fields. In addition, Quorum 8 will expand the possibility of virtual space with the software. The future will be all about contactless technology and virtual spaces, which will be helpful in making the lives of its citizens easier and more diversified. Soaked in spirituality and steeped in history, Ujjain is a city that magnetized devotees from all over India. In this land of shrines, people from varied horizons of country gather to celebrate several festivals. One such illustrious festival is Hanuman Ashtami, which was recently celebrated to mark victory of Lord Hanuman. <laughs> The sculpture of Lord Hanuman, who is believed as the son of Vayu, is decorated with lights and garlands. Crypt with spiritual energy and ancient presence, this Hanuman temple is captivating the minds of people with its rich rituals and cultural essence. The priest is performing Maha Aarti, holding large fire diyas, being performed to pay gratitude to God. Aarti is pouring positivity in the surrounding and purifying thoughts. While performing the rituals, devotees are chanting mantras, ringing bells and offering sacred rituals. These mesmerizing visuals are of the Hanuman Ashtami festival which was recently celebrated in the holy city of Ujjain. ये एक सौ आठ हनुमान यात्रा है हम 40 साल से करीब करीब कर रहे हैं इसको और ये प्राचीन मंदिर हैं ये पुराने और प्रारंभिक जो पूजा वगैरह होती है उसके द्वारा मंदिर पूजा होती है पूरे शहर में इक्यावन किलोमीटर की यात्रा है कम से कम और ग्यारह घंटे लगते हैं इसके अंदर पीपल इन ह्यूज नंबर टुक पार्ट इन फिफ्टी वन किलोमीटर प्रोसेशन इन चांटिंग भजन एंड डिवोटेड दमसेल्स इन स्पिरिचुअलिटी डेविटीज कुड बी सीन कैरिंग आउट यात्रा ऑन बाइक्स यहाँ की मान्यता यह है अवंतिका शुद्ध क्षेत्र में यह श्री उत्तरामुखी हनुमान मंदिर अनादिकाल से यहाँ पर विद्यमान है स्कंद पुराण में 108 हनुमान का महत्व है दिस एंशियंट कल्चर ऑफ सेलिब्रेटिंग हनुमान अष्टमी डिराइव फ्रॉम द हिंदू स्क्रिप्चर्स हनुमान अष्टमी इज दी कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ हनुमान जी विक्ट्री फेस्टिवल According to religious textbooks, during the war between Lord Ram and Ravan, Ahiravan wanted to sacrifice Lord Ram and his brother Lakshman by taking them to Patal Lok. He wanted to sacrifice both brothers, but Lord Hanuman defeated him in the war and killed him and released the Lord. Devotees believe that Lord Hanuman embodies strength like none. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.